So without further ado, I'm going to quickly introduce our subject, zip through the panelists. They've also all promised not to go over length, so we have more time to talk. Okay, so we are talking about balance in the world economy. Um, balance within economies, we know they're very unbalanced. Rising income inequality, I think a subject everyone should be worried about. And that's not just in the United States, it's in Zhu Min's China. Uh, and also the world economy overall, uh, terribly imbalanced with the surplus and the deficit countries not really being able to dance together. So that is our big subject. There's certainly a lot to talk about. First, we're going to hear from Professor George Akerlof, the famous, brilliant Nobel Prize winner. We all, I hope, read his paper on the market for lemons before coming here, um, and maybe more recently, uh, his book, Animal Spirits. Then we're going to hear from Neil Ferguson. Neil actually is really an annoying person for a mere journalist like me because he is officially a professor. He writes these learned, a professor at like great places like Harvard and LSE, writes these learned books, but he also practices journalism, writing columns, doing TV shows, better than most journalists do. Fortunately, I like him, so I will forgive him, Thanks. but it is kind of annoying. Uh, Andres Velasco, former Minister of, Minister of Finance of Chile, also a card-carrying professor of economics, economist. Uh, he has practiced what he preaches as the Minister of Finance of Chile. He told me, uh, proudly before we walked on stage that the reason he knows how to put on his mic so well is when he was Minister of Finance, his favorite place for selling his economic programs was cook shows. Uh, so I will expect a little bit of that showmanship. And he's even more of a Renaissance man than Neil Ferguson. He writes novels. Uh, his latest one is about a Latin American professor uh, who finds himself exiled among the lefties of Vermont. Only available to Spanish readers at the moment, but we can all lobby for its imminent translation. Uh, and finally, the most important person here, my friend, Min Zhu, uh, who is special advisor to uh, the MD of the IMF at the moment. Uh, he has held important, po he is also a card-carrying economist professional economist, was uh, the deputy head of the Bank of China, and can bring that crucial perspective of not only what the IMF is doing, but where China fits into this equation. So without further ado, Professor Akerlof, please okay. dazzle us. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm not sure whether I'm going to dazzle you or not. Um, so OK, so I need some slides. OK, there are some slides. So, um, so I thought that uh, Rob Johnson, asked me, when he asked me to give this talk, to say a few words about new economic thinking as uh, part of the beginning to the end of this conference. So I thought I'd make some very general remarks. Um, but actually, in making these general remarks, I found surprisingly that, that the remarks are also going to be relevant to the topic of this uh, session, which is equity adjustment and balance in the world economy. So I'm going to base my remarks on a conversation that I had with Rob recently at the International Monetary Fund. And I'm going to discuss some general reasons, some general reasons why we need new economic thinking and how to identify places where it's going to be useful. The economics profession acts as if we're at the uh, end of economics. Now, there's a good reason for that. The National Bureau of Economic Research, now we have to see whether we're going to get this to work. Uh, next, OK. The National Bureau of Economic Research uh, is now up to paper 16,920. Now, what that suggests that it is that if it's not been said before, it's not worth saying. Now, despite this large number of papers, despite going to number 16920, prior to the summer of 2007, there were only a handful of economists, only a handful of economists who were predicting the financial crisis that was at that point already inevitable. And even as late as the summer of 2008, many macroeconomists were still in denial. Now, I think that one of the reasons uh, that we're having problems is that our economic 
methodology eschews sufficiently close observation. Now, the view I'm going to take is going to be in total disagreement with Milton Friedman's methodology of positive economics, which I think unfortunately uh, informs to a great extent how economists think economics should be done at the moment. So I think one of our major problems here is that we act as if the economic concepts that we construct are real things. But that's wrong, and this thinking of these things as real things leads us into error. So I'm going to give you two examples, and those two examples come from my first economics course, which I took as a freshman at Yale back in 1958, and I think these two concepts were probably also in yours, too. So let me give you the first example. Okay. The first example is the production function. And um, that's one of the things we were taught back in 1958. There's this production function, and we said that output is a function of labor and capital. Now, that co concept can be useful, but that usefulness may not generalize. So let's consider growth accounting, for example. So using the production function, my favorite economist, Robert Solo, has convincingly shown that growth in per capita income in the United States occurred mainly because of changes in technology. Changes in the capital labor ratio had accounted for only one eighth, one -eighth of the change in output uh, per capita that had occurred. And those results are extremely robust. Now, Solo used the production function appropriately. But then, other uses of the exact same concept are much shakier. I'm going to give you some examples. So consider the returns to capital and consider optimal tax policy. Supposing we believe, as in that production function, that capital is something that's sort of homogeneous jelly. It's all the same. Now, that has many implications. The average return to capital is then the marginal return to capital. So the average return and the marginal return are the same. And empirically, we can even calculate both of those things. And when you do that calculation, it shows a high rate of return. That high re rate of return says, in turn, that we should tax capital lightly. Now, why? What's the reason for that? Otherwise, if we don't tax it lightly, what we're doing is we're denying everyone the potential to save quite modest sums, to save quite modest sums when they are young, and then they end up quite rich when they're old. So we don't want to do that. Now, um, there's a different view of capital. It's not jelly capital, but it's specific projects capital. Those projects take the form of buildings and fac houses and factories and McDonald's and zoos and other things that you can name, like gas stations and who knows what else. Uh, I guess gas stations. They're not. So each of these investments is based also on a specific idea. So it's a specific idea about a specific investment in a specific place at a specific time. And those ideas tend to be generated as a byproduct of ongoing businesses. And those ideas, at least the good ones, those tend to be scarce. So we put the best ones in first, and then there are diminishing returns. So I can remember James Tobin, for example, asking my wife when she was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, he said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the, when you build more? You're going to build more amusement parks. So with the amusement parks view, the marginal return to capital can be low, even if the average return is high. So Silicon Valley's Len Baker does very well when he makes his marginal investment, but George Akerlof goes bankrupt when he makes his. So the question is, where is the error of methodology? So we've acted as if this production function is a real thing. And because we thought of it as a real thing, we have unquestionably appropriated it from one area of economics to another. OK, so now I want to show you that, in fact, this does have consequences. Regarding the very topic of this session, our wrong theory has given the wrong guidance regarding how to restore equity. We should not be exempting capital income from taxation. Regarding global imbalances, 
Now, return, going back to the last session, for those of you who were the, here in the last session, regarding global imbalances, it explains, it gives one explanation why China finds it useful to hold large reserves with very uh, low returns. The average return to capital in China may be very high, we know it is. But new projects take new ideas, and those new ideas are in scarce supply, probably even in China. So the marginal return is likely to be very low. Okay, so that's my first example of where we've taken something that is just an economic concept, we've acted as if this thing is a thing, and then we've, said we've moved it around the room and we've said we can use it anywhere. But in some places it's appropriate to use it, other places it's not. Now I'm going to give you a second example. Okay, consequences, we've done that. Utility function. Let me now go to a second example of an economic concept that's been treated as if it were a real thing, and that's the utility function. It's probably no abuse of the utility function to use it to illustrate what underlies the demand for apples and oranges on a trip to the supermarket. That, of course, as you know, is the textbook example. More generally, the utility function is a potentially useful classificatory device. So there's a general sense in which it is always useful. By asking what people maximize when they make their decisions, we can classify the factors that go into their thought processes. So we can classify motivations. But then it seems that economists very frequently make a mistake. They act as if the utility function is a thing. By that I mean they act as if it's stable and never changing. It's like a piece of furniture that you can just move around the room as you wish. So that's very different from the general proposition, which I think is tr generally true, that there's a correspondence between the decisions that people make and the utility function that people have at the time they make those decisions. That utility function takes into account the factors that people weigh when they make those decisions in the exact context in which the people make them. So now let me give some applications and generalizations to this. In contrast, to assume that people have a utility function that does not change over context, that it turns out is a very strong assumption. Let me just give you one indication as to how strong an assumption it is. It fails to take into account that the way in which people are most commonly manipulated is to put them in situations where their utility function changes with the manipulation. So that manipulation is in fact something that's very useful. It is fact, it's actually something basic to how economic systems work. Work. It solves the free rider problem in most organizations, and of course how organizations work is the key to how almost all economies work. So just to give you some examples, it solves the free rider problem in every institution, in every institution from General Motors to the IMF to the US Army to any other institution that you want to think of. When you put people in those situations, you tell them they're supposed to do their job, then they're in that situation and they tend to behave that way. So that, now let me give you a local example, a very local example of what it means for the utility function to change. So that's for each and every one of you in this audience. Think about what you're doing here at this very moment at this conference. While you're here, you're making various decisions uh, about what, where to sit, which speaker to, get, to listen to, how you're supposed to listen, and so forth. You're doing that really very intensely. Now what does that do? That corresponds to the story, to the story you're telling yourself regarding what you're doing here and why you're doing it. The moment that you leave here, the moment that you're going to leave this hotel to here tonight or tomorrow morning, you're going to be in a different context and you're going to be telling yourself a very different story. And in that different story with a different focus, your utility function will, be, will have changed and you're going to be thinking about different things and being going to be making different decisions. Indeed. In that different world, with a different focus, your utility function will have changed. See, so indeed, the whole idea that humans can focus is the idea that our utility function can change. And as it changes, we change what we want and the decisions that we will make. And that's basic. That's basic to being, being human. 
So their economists make an error. So they start with the assumption of the singular case. The singular case is that utility is stable and unchanging and that it is a thing. And so as an economist, that's what you're supposed to believe. And I've seen people say that, that you're not an economist unless you believe that. But in fact, the methodology is reversed, and it's reversed from what it should be. What needs to be proved before it's used is that you're making a really strong assumption. What needs to be proved before it's used should be the specific case. Much of our error in economics comes from getting that, this point sadly wrong. So I want to conclude that there are a very large number of, that what I'm saying here, I'm just giving you two examples. I want to conclude that there are a very large number of concepts in economics that get used out of context, and when used out of context, they lead to surprising results. So I'm going to give you nine examples of these, but I'm not going to go over them. So the intertemporal utility function, inflationary expectations, money illusion and its absence, the demand for money, shocks, risk, loss aversion, human capital, the firm. I actually have longer lists than that, but that's what fit onto this page. So now let me talk about INET economics. So whenever these concepts yield surprising results, results that, that somehow you would say, gee, I wouldn't have thought about that unless I were an economist or unless I knew these concepts. As, an, as members of INET, we have an INET duty, and our duty is to be suspicious. We have to see whether those results hold with a finer characterization of motivation or of situation. So returning to my conversation with Rob, one of my hopes for INET is to engender a finer grain economics. It's a finer grain economics which has the following rule. That rule is that you look before you leap. So when I want to come to the end, I say there may be no problem with using the production function. There may be no problem with using the utility function or any of the items on my previous list. Um, but when you use them, you have to remember or you have to think, well, maybe this is the first approximation, and when you take the second approximation, you may get a different result. You should look to see whether it really does fit the decision-making context where you're going to use it. If not, if it doesn't fit that decision-making context, then you have to do some new economic thinking. So I think then when we begin to do this new economic thinking, we're going to begin to get economics that goes beyond the textbooks, and that will begin to plug the many holes that we have in economics. So to end, uh, working paper number 16920 may be a beginning rather than the end of economics. So thank you very much. <laughs>